Uh, believe it or not, Rich Beatty gave us an introduction to the study of the Sermon on the Mount this morning. You didn't realize that, did you, Rich? Well, you're quite welcome, sir. <laughs> I appreciate it. We sang, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Where does that come from? The Sermon on the Mount. Man does not live by bread alone. That's chapter 4. Of course, that's also Deuteronomy chapter 8. And then, of course, ask it, it will be given to you. Seek and ye shall find, and knock and the door shall be open to you. That's Matthew chapter 6. So he gave us the introduction. Then, uh, what was the song we finished with, Rich? Uh, Solid Rock. Huh? Solid Rock. Yeah. All other ground is sinking sand. Guess what? Matthew chapter 7. Thank you, Rich. You, you gave the introduction to the, uh, to the new series here. But the more I studied the Sermon on the Mount, which I've read many, many times over the years, I felt like we need to get context here because there's a lot of information you need to, that will help you understand what's going on here on the Sermon on the Mount, which we really don't know where it actually took place. We believe it was in Galilee, is what they're saying, perhaps near Capernaum. There, there's a place they call the Mount of Beatitudes now. It wasn't a mountain, by the way. We're talking more like a hill. Not a mountain, but a hill. But uh, it is a reintroduction of the Lord to the people. But I want to start off, first of all, why do we have a Bible study? You ever wonder why we do this? Was it commanded in the Bible? Well, yes, in a sense it was. And if you remember, uh, uh, the last uh, commandment from Jesus was go and make disciples. A disciple is a learner, a student, if you was, uh, if, uh, is what it is. And if you remember, an elder must be able to teach. Also deacons too, by the way. They both have to be able to teach. That doesn't mean they have to be the greatest Bible scholar, but they certainly have to be able to com com uh, teach the uh, basic truths of the Bible. And uh, one, of the most, uh, one of the best teachers I ever knew was my uncle. Eighth grade education, he had to drop out during the Depression to uh, help support the family. But oh, he knew his Bible. And he studied real hard. He was able to teach uh, the Bible. But also, uh, we are encouraged to abide in the word of Jesus Christ. It says, uh, if you abide in my word, you are my learners, or disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that is from John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Also, cultural literacy. You'd be surprised how many biblical phrases and words we use today, and we don't think about it. Perhaps more so in the 19th century. It was said that Abraham Lincoln read so much of the Bible, he incorporated that into his speech, and it was very natural. And people didn't realize he was speaking the Bible to him. So there was an impact, and this is one of them. And if you ask the regular guy on the street, who's not familiar with the Bible, who quoted this scripture here? They would say, oh, Abraham Lincoln. Well, Abraham Lincoln, by the way, he was an atheist at one time and later on became a Christian. But uh, he would read this scripture or speak this scripture all the time, naturally in conversation. There's also, how about this, scapegoat. You hear this term all the time, oh, you're making me a scapegoat. In the laboratory where I work, we always say when something goes wrong, blame the person who's not there to defend themselves, right? <laughs> you know how it works? You know, it's probably even shifted that it wasn't me. And uh, how about this? Blind leading the blind? How about this? Good Samaritan. Do you realize how many good Samaritan hospitals there are in the United States? We have a program called CRM where we could pull up any hospital in the United States. And if you type in Good Samaritan, I think every state in the union has at least one and sometimes multiple sites. And you're trying to figure out, okay, which one do I want to go to, especially in New York State? How about this one? Old as Methuselah. We use that all the time. I've seen a few guys like that as old as Methuselah. How about this one? I'm at my wit's end. You thought that was a modern phrase, but that's out of the Bible. 
Or, a little birdie told me. You thought that was something we made up. That's out of the Bible. There it is right there, Ecclesiastes. Or, rise and shine. You thought that was also something from just regular contemporary culture, but that is from the Bible. How about this one? Sour grapes. You hear that phrase all the time. Oh, that losing football team, they're just, they're just sour grapes, right? You hear that all the time. Or, the writing is on the wall. You hear that all the time. Or, how about this? Salt of the earth. Oh, that person's the salt of the earth. That's something about, man, they're somebody that's preserving society or their family. Or how about this? Going the extra mile. That comes out of the Sermon on the Mount. How about this? The truth will set you free. I hear that all the time. And most times they don't even know what it means. The truth will set you free. Or how about this one? Labor of love. You hear that one? Quite a bit. And of course, Armageddon. Everything's Armageddon. Or if you see like a football game between LSU and Alabama, oh, it's going to be Armageddon for one of those teams. You hear that all the time. And so uh, we need to understand, you know, we use these phrases all the time. This is just a few of them, by the way. We also need to understand what the Bible really says. I hear so many misquotations. You want to be free from the ignorance. You want to be free from, uh, you know, you want to be able to make correct judgments and decisions. And how about this one? We just mentioned this. The truth will set you free, right? That's not accurate. It is, if you abide in my words, you're my disciples indeed. Abide means to feed on it. You just store it in your body. You just keep it in your mind at all times. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's not just, oh, all of a sudden, the truth is going to make me free. Well, what is the truth? Who knows what it is unless you get to the Bible? How about this one? God helps those who help themselves. If you could show me where that is in the Bible, show me, because I have never seen it there. Or how about this one? Cleanliness is next to godliness. That came out of England, by the way. There was a minister who was uh, taking care of the sh children that were running the streets all the time, orphans. And he said they smell bad. And he says, you know, cleanliness is next to God and his kids. Why don't you take a bath, basically, as we was telling him. But you want to abide. You want to soak it up, feed on it, understand it, obey it. it all those things. How about this? Personal ed edification and building of faith. If you want to build faith, you need to get into the Word of God. The Bible says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. I love that verse, because if you love God's law, then you know what He's up to. And by the way, you know a law is something that cannot be changed. And so it's very, very important. I like this one. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what does that mean? Doctrine says, this is what is right. Reproof says, you're wrong. Correction means, I'm going to get you right. And instruction in righteousness means, I'm going to keep you right. So there you have a four-point sermon just right there, the 30 seconds I just gave you. But that's what Scripture is for. And then, of course, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I believe it was Dwight L. Moody who says, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed for faith. It never came. I got into the Word of God and just abided it and fed on it, and I developed faith. So it's very, very important to develop faith. Another thing, you can use the Word of God to help others. It's always good to have a word there. You can give them encouraging words of wisdom. You can pray with others who need encouragement, and so you can help you pray more effectively. We're going to talk about prayer since that's what the Sermon on the Mount deals with, but one of the things I have found is praying the Word of God back to Him. For instance, I have a brother that's not saved, and I say, Lord, you came to seek and to save the lost. That was what you told me in your Word. Seek out my brother, Lord. See, that's how you can pray. Or how about this? Lord, you commanded me to love my wife. I'm not sure I'm doing it all correctly. Will you show me how to love my wife? So that's how you can pray the word of God back to him. 
There, we're not going to go there, but in Daniel, Daniel read the writings of uh, Jeremiah, and he went back to God and said, well, you know, God, you said 70 years, we're going to be in exile. Okay, now what about this? And of course, God answered his prayer. So it's a good way to pray. And of course, to understand our Lord and his plans. For Steve did a great job on what we would call the last things, the coming of the Lord. And it explains God. It explains what he's up to, his person, his nature, his wonders, and so forth. And so it is wonderful to get into the Word of God. We don't do it just because, you know, it's a fun thing to do. You know, we come out smarter. That's what happened to the Ephesian church. If you remember that from uh, Revelation, they were a very, very smart church. But they weren't a very loving church. And that's where they were messed up there. So anyway, uh, that's just a few little items there of why we study the Bible. And so now we would like to get into the uh, uh, Matthew. And like I said, I wanted to do some background stuff. So this week we're going to study a little bit about what was going on at this time. But we're going to relate it back to the Old Testament. And then next week, we're going to be studying about the Levitical blessings. And if you remember, the Sermon on the Mount begins with bless, 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 over and over again. Well, that's a Levitical blessing. So we're going to go back to the Old Testament to figure out what this is all about. And then we're going to talk about when God says no, and no means no. And you see that several times in the, uh, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Also, we'll study about grace. I was telling Hollis yesterday, guess what? The word grace is not found in the book of Matthew, right? Look it up if you want to. It's not found in the book of Mark. It's only found one time in the gospel according to Luke. And it just simply means the grace of God was on our Lord Jesus, just one time. But then you get over to the gospel of John, and it says, Jesus was full of grace and truth. That means everything he'd done or did in his ministry was based upon the truth and upon grace. But then it says right after that, from his fullness he, we have all received grace upon grace. And that's a picture word. John, probably on the Isle of Patmos, was walking along the ocean, and all of a sudden a wave came in and probably splashed him. And then he walked a little bit further along, and then all of a sudden a wave splashed him again. And then he was walking along again, and all of a sudden he got splashed again. So that's what the picture is. Grace is splashing on us, and we think we got everything from God. He comes along again, he splashes again with more grace. And then we think we got everything, he splashes us again with more grace, over and over and over again. Grace is not just salvation, and we're going to heaven, but grace is how God helps us to get through life. We'll talk about that as well. So anyway... Let's do a little bit of introduction here about Matthew. And Matthew, oh, by the way, I read this also. You know, the New Testament starts off with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What if the New Testament started off with the book of Revelation? Think about how lost you would be. I mean, all of a sudden you're jumping in, and John has his vision, and all of a sudden you see all these terrible things that are going to happen during the tribulation, and you're like, Man, what's going on here? No context at all. And so God was smart enough to make sure the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were at the very beginning to kind of let you know, here is the ministry of our Lord, and he kept the last things to the very last, of it, which is the book of Revelation. But Matthew, being a Jewish person, we know that he was a tax collector, his purpose was to show us, here is your sovereign, here is your king. That's what he was trying to prove to all the Jewish people. He wrote to the Jewish people. Mark was a little bit different. Now Mark, under the direction of Peter, said, well, here's your servant. Here's the guy that came to serve. He said, this, he didn't come to, uh, to be served, he came to serve, is what the Bible says. And then, of course, Luke says, here is your son of man, the perfect God man. And Luke was writing primarily to Gentiles. 
And then, of course, we have John. Here is the Son of God, who he was writing to both the Gentiles and the Jews. And so we have four Gospels together that give us a complete picture of who Jesus is. I mean, think of it this way. We got this really pretty picture over here. Think about it. Let's say Chris came in one day. He started painting on the canvas, and then he stopped. And then Steve Hudson came in and said, well, let me put some more paint on here. And he painted. And then, of course, maybe Hollis came in and said, well, you need a little more tone here. And he started painting. And somehow you came up with this picture right here, right? Probably not. Uh, I can't do that. <laughs> you could do that? Oh, okay. But each had a different perspective of what they were trying to communicate to their audience. And, but together, we have a complete picture of who Jesus is and who God is. That's what's going on here. Now, Matthew is a bridge between the Old and New Testament, just like Exodus is a bridge between Genesis and Exodus. There's a bridge that occurs. And it's really interesting when you look at these two paired books. Actually, uh, Matthew would be paired with Malachi, and then, of course, Genesis is paired with uh, Exodus there. And there was a promise of deliverance and in, in, uh, in freedom at the end of Genesis. The very last words of Joseph were, you're going to be leaving here one day. Take my bones with you. Don't leave my bones behind. And then, of course, in uh, Malachi, there's a promise of Elijah, the Elijah to come, who turns out to be John the Baptist. And, of course, the Lord himself is going to come. So in both cases, there's a promise of deliverance. But, and here's the verse here, and Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. Don't even leave my body here. I want to be buried over in the promised land. Here it is in uh, Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now keep in mind, Elijah was long dead at this point in time. Before the coming of the great and dread, dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their father, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And that's in Malachi. So there's a promise coming. However, there's probably about 400 years between Genesis and Exodus, and there's about 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Now think of it. Get your mind set in these people. You're the first generation. Joseph says, okay, you're going to leave here. Take my bones with you. And they said, okay, we promise you by oath, we're going to take your body away. And about 50 years later, you have a new generation coming up. And, well, you know, mom and dad says we're going to be leaving here soon. But then you get to be 150 years, and you have another generation. Well, maybe God changed his mind. And then you get here, you know, 300 years later. And you think, well, okay. It ain't true. That's just an old wives' tale. You know, grandma told me this. And, okay, it's grandma. I'll just take it with a grain of salt. And then you get 400 years later, it's like, really? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's just no wives' tale. We're just not going to pay attention to that anymore. So you have 400 years. And, of course, that 400 years between Malachi and Matthew is called the silent years by theologians. The only reason they call it the silent years is because there was no new revelation from God. The last revelation was Malachi, 400 years, nothing. That doesn't mean... There was nothing going on. If you read the histori uh, historical accounts, you know, the Syrians had came in, took over, and then the Greeks came in. Alexander the Great, Great came in there. And for, uh, then Alexander the Great's generals took over, and they were very wicked. And then for about 100 years, there was freedom for the Jewish, the Maccabeans. If you study their history, it's really uh, quite dramatic. And then the Romans came in. So it's just 400 years of domination and freedom and then domination again. There were things going on, but in both cases, in Genesis to Exodus, the Egyptians were in control, and Matthew, the Romans were in control. They were in slavery to, to foreign countries. So think about it. You know, maybe God has changed his mind. Even today, 
Uh, there are some evangelicals who say, well, you know, Jesus didn't really mean that he was going to come again. And he just said we had to live in such a way to make this place a wonderful place to be by his principles. And so you'd be surprised how many evangelical churches do not believe that God is going to return again. They just don't. In spite of what the word says, they don't believe. And so we have the bondage there. And then the, at the beginning of Exodus, there was no formal religious practice. There was no law given to telling them how to worship God. Okay, that hadn't come till after they left Egypt. In Matthew, religion was a bur burden, not a blessing. It was really bad, folks. Let me tell you, if you go study the historical accounts and see what they were uh, believing, uh, it was very twisted and very burdensome. Uh, they would write a commentary on the law of Moses, and it was so complex, they had to write a commentary to explain the commentary. And this is not a lie. This actually happened. And so there was so much confusion there about what the law required. And examples today uh, from, from evangelical churches. I've heard this, folks. If you're not healed, you're sick, that means you don't have enough faith. I've heard that over and over again. And I want to tell you, some of the people that I've known of great faith have been people that have suffered physically. Okay? I've known that. If you're not baptized, you're not born again. I've heard that too. There is a group of Christians, a, a church, I think it's the Church of Christ, that believes if you're not baptized, you're not going to heaven. They can't explain the thief on the cross, though. Or you must dress in a certain way to be holy. And I know there are some religious groups that require their men and women to dress a certain way. And if you're not dressed a certain way, you're not holy. You're not right before God. Or if you do not speak in tongues, you are not baptized by the Holy Spirit. You hear that quite a bit. They confuse baptism with the gifts of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Or you must earn God's love. How about that one? Oh, God, I'm going to do something. I'm going to earn your love. That's what the Pharisees were doing. I got to do this. I got to do this. I can do this. Then maybe God might like me or he might love me. You hear that quite a bit. Or... You must earn God's forgiveness. I got to do this and this and I did this. Okay, I got to make restitution. Then maybe God will forgive me. Just completely ignoring the word of God. Here's the really kicker here. The Sadducees were in charge of the temple, but they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. Okay, guys, why are you maintaining worship of God? You don't even believe in all this stuff, right? Think about it. Okay, they're in charge of the temple. You've got to bring the temple tax. You've got to go through all the rituals and everything. Oh, by the <clears> way, there is no resurrection of the dead, so don't worry about it. This is all you have right now. So I like the old, it's a bad joke, but the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. I know, it's a bad joke. But they were, and uh, they didn't believe it. So, okay. And you can imagine people saying, well, did God forget their promises? Oh, oh, forget it, man. It's just not worth it. You know, let's just go about our business and, and uh, you know, do our own thing. And, of course, in Exodus, the people didn't even know his proper name. They knew there was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they really didn't know his formal name, of course, was Jehovah or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce that, or the great I am, I am that I am. And, of course, in Matthew, it was even forbidden to mention God's name except by the priests on the Day of Atonement. But keep in mind, the Sadducees didn't even believe in a, uh, a living God. Can you believe that? That's just amazing. Of course, Matthew, we know he was a tax collector. And it was not like tax collectors today. So don't uh, equate the two there. Uh, a tax collector was a Jewish person who got a franchise from Rome to collect tax from the uh, people on behalf of Rome. They basically bought a franchise is what it was. Think of this Matthew who was from Capernaum, and he would uh, collect taxes, but then he would put a value-added tax on, on top of that so he could make a profit. But then business got too big, so then he would go out and hire another person and say, look, 
I need this much tax, I need this value added tax, then you can kick on your own value added tax and just collect the taxes. And then they would hire people and they would keep adding and adding and adding. If you remember, uh, when the tax collectors went to hear John the Baptist preach, they said, what should we do? John the Baptist said, just collect what is right and legal. That's all you should do. And so the people hated the tax collector. They were a very easy group to hate. And they would look down upon them because they were considered traitors there. And so uh, it was very, very dishonest. And it wasn't like today where you could say, well, I'm going to go to court and sue because you're cheating me out of my money. Herod didn't care. All Herod cared about was, I got my money. I don't care about you guys. I got what I want. That's how it worked. And as long as there was law and order, they got their money. In Rome, there was no recourse. Of course, Matthew was also known as Levi, which means unity. By the way, Matthew, the word Matthew, it means gift of God. So his name means a grace gift of God. And of course, we got the gospel, the good news. And of course, it's about him presenting the, uh, the Messiah to the people. That was Jesus. And of course, Matthew, when he became a believer, immediately invited other tax collectors to his house to meet with the Lord. And he invited as many people as that could come so that they could hear. Here's something I've always wondered about. Luke 18, 9 through 4. You can write that down, look at it later. But this was a parable. And if you remember, the Pharisee went to the temple and he started to pray, the Bible says, with himself. Interesting word. He wasn't praying to God, he was praying with himself. And he would say, oh, I'm glad I'm not like other people. I'm not like evildoers and murderers and adulterers, and I'm not like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I tithe everything. I live righteously. But then there was a tax collector, and he was standing there, and he was beating his chest. Oh, God, have mercy on me. Just have mercy. I am a sinner. I deserve nothing. I'm just a sinner. Have mercy, God. I sometimes wonder if that wasn't Matthew's testimony. It doesn't tell us that, but I just wonder about that. We talked about this. John commanded, collect only what is fair. And if you remember, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, uh, was called down by Jesus. Jesus says, I'm coming to your house to have dinner. And Zacchaeus became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I am going to restore four times what I took from people illegally. And the, the, the uh, construction of the language is, if I have cheated anything out of anybody, and I have, I'm going to restore it four times. So we have another tax collector that became, repented and received the Lord Jesus as well. So here's that verse from uh, Luke chapter 18. And of course, there's the conclusion at the bottom. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God because he came just asking for mercy. That's one thing about when you become a believer. A lot of people say you've got to pray a certain prayer. Well, all he did was just have mercy on me, God. And what did the thief on the cross say? Just remember me, Lord. Just remember me. So the Gospel of Matthew can be thought of as a reintroduction to the Lord. In Exodus, going back to um, Moses, who's considered probably after Abraham, what the greatest man in the Old Testament, uh, he said one time to the Lord, please show me your glory. That was his prayer. And if you remember, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he says, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. In other words, you can't see my glory. It's too much for you physically to bear. But the Lord did something even better. Now, did uh, uh, Moses not know God? Well, he knew God from the burning bush from afar. He knew God in the pillar of fire and the cloud of pillar as well. And he knew him when he went to the tabernacle, but Moses wanted to know God even better. 
And so this is what the Lord did for him. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, that's the formal name of God, by the way, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity, transgression, and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's Exodus 34. It's a wonderful verse. And actually, that's a foundation of knowing who God is in terms of his purpose and his personality and his goodness. He's merciful, holding back what we deserve, gracious, giving what we do deserve, long-suffering, being patient with us so that we repent, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. By no means clear the guilty. These are the people that refuse to receive the Lord and they suffer the consequences because it goes to their children too. So we're introducing to who God is, not just a mighty God in a flame of fire or a pillar or somebody that can make the uh, ground shake or bring judgment on the Egyptians, but here's his purposes and this goes out to the entire Bible all the way to Revelation. Talking about merciful, I was thinking about this, Steve. You know, you did your excellent uh, presentation and you talked about the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, the evangelists in the, old, in the uh, book of Revelation. Did you know in the book of, or the Gospel of Matthew, it says that God could call out 12, or Jesus could call out 12 legions of angels to rescue him. You know how many angels that is? 144,000. He's merciful. He could call those angels. He says, no, no, no. I'm not going to call the angels to destroy the earth, but I'll be gracious and I'll send out 144,000 evangelists to tell people how they can receive God. Isn't that interesting? He held back. I wouldn't have held back, but I'm not God either. Bible says he's a rewarder, reward, rewarder of those who diligently seek him, but then we get over to uh, Matthew in chapter 5, verse 2, where Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and of course we're going to go through all this, but here Jesus is reintroducing God to us because there was so much clutter, so much confusion. The traditions of the Jewish people became more important than the word of God. And God had to come in here and straighten things out personally. And so we're going to have God himself speaking here and teaching. So here we have in Matthew, and this is really interesting. This is very, very important. Uh, Jesus is introducing God the Father to the people. And in chapters 5, 6, and, six and 7, Father is mentioned 15 times. Now, why is this important? Because in the Old Testament, God is not father to the individual. It's never mentioned. 14 times in the Old Testament, God is mentioned as father to the nation of Israel. Very impersonal, very set apart. But now, you're going to see father in relation to the individual. Let me show you some examples here. Those who make peace are like their Father in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 5, 9. So if you're a person that makes peace, you're just like your Father. As a disciple of Christ who walks in, righteous, uh, uh, walks in righteousness, we glorify our Father in heaven. Let your light shine before men in such a way they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Well, that's radical teaching there, because it was never mentioned that God could be my father individually anywhere in the Old Testament, but we're seeing this in the New Testament. How about this? Love for the unlovable, especially love for our enemies, displays the Father's love. That's Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 45. How about this one? The disciples call to be perfect like our Heavenly Father is perfect. Back then, you would never have said, oh, God is my father. 
you'd never say that. Try going into a traditional uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, synagogue today and say, Jehovah loves you. I think that happened to you one time, didn't it, Steve? Yeah. You came out alive, though, right? <laughs> they, not quite. Yeah. Bruce? The name of, I, I asked, I was very ignorant of their ways, and so I asked, I was in a Jewish synagogue at, for a wedding, and um, I asked them a question about Jehovah. Well, when I said the name Jehovah, I thought that they were going to just jump down my throat. They said, we don't speak his name here. And, uh, that's considered holy. So if you're ever in a Jewish congregation, don't use the name Jehovah or Yahweh. They didn't throw you over the cliff or anything. Say again? They didn't throw you off the cliff. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to, right? <laughs> Here's another one. The Father takes note and rewards those who give in secret, pray in secret, and fast in secret. He takes note of that. Your father is paying attention to what, you have, what you're doing. The Bible says, though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. Talking to the father is a great privilege given to the child of God. Our father who art in heaven. Great. How about this? Anxiety comes when we don't know and trust our heavenly father. Jesus talks about your heavenly Father knows what you need, O oh, you of little faith. Now, because we have our relationship with Jesus, our Savior, we can now say, our Father, or as Paul said in Romans, Abba, the Aramaic word for Dada, is what that is. But you never did that in the Old Testament. And for Jesus to say this in his context there in Galilee was very radical. You can imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees, oh my goodness, this guy, he's trying to destroy the law and the prophets. And yet he's saying, Father, 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 over and over and over again. And so very, very different. So the people, man, they were probably just riveted to what he had to say. You mean God is my Father? Yes, he is. Now, uh, the other thing about Jesus is his credentials. Have you ever seen anybody hired into a job and they were totally unqualified for that job because they didn't have the right credentials? I've seen a few of those over the years where it's like, how in the world did he get put in that position because he knows absolutely nothing of what's going on? And so credentials are important. Why is that? Why did, uh, and of course, credentials is nothing new. Look at that up there. Credentials are important. Uh, why are credentials important? Back then, they had many people claiming to be the Messiah. But they were the Messiah who was going to overthrow Rome and lead a revolt and become an independent nation again and to restore the beauty of Solomon and the temple and so forth. And so God saw fit that they had to be credentials and... Matthew wanted to make sure people knew Jesus had the right credentials. He's the real deal. And he was there because uh, he was actually the Messiah and he had proof of it. Now here is verse Matthew chapter 21. When he came into the temple, the chief priests and elders, other people confronted him as he was teaching and says, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you these authorities? They're asking, what are your qualifications? When I got hired into my job, they ask, okay, are you licensed? Oh yeah, pop it out, licensed by the crediting agency. Okay, we'll hire you. If I didn't have that license, I wouldn't get my job. But I have seen cases where people got hired and it's like, okay, where did they come from? So, what about the credentials? Well, first of all, genealogy. If you remember, it was told to Abraham and reiterated to David, from your line, a king, a messiah will come. And so genealogy is important. If you remember the very beginning of Matthew, Matthew goes through the genealogy of Jesus step by step through 14, 14, 14 names that he lists there. We tend to kind of mumble through those names and say, yeah, yeah, okay, he is the son of Abraham, son of David. He is of the right line and everything. But we are going to find out there was grace in that line there. We're going to study when we talk about grace uh, in, the, in the book of Matthew. The angel's testimony. Remember what the angel says? What's born of you is of the Holy Spirit, and his name is going to be called Jesus. He's going to save the people from their sins. 
He's also going to be called Emmanuel, God with us. So we have the credential of the angel's testimony there. So he shall be called Emmanuel, conceived of the Holy Spirit, and will be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Before he was even conceived, we already know what the purpose is going to be. But then, how about the Magi's testimony? What did they say? Where is he who was born king of the Jews? I find this really interesting. How did the Magi know there was a king? Well, they said, well, there was a star. Well, how did they know that that star meant there was a king of the Jews? A lot of the people I study think it was Daniel. Because if you remember from the book of Daniel, after Daniel interpreted uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, you are in charge of all the wise men in the nation. Well, if he's going to be president of the university, he sets the agenda of what they need to know. And so a lot of people believe the Magi knew the teachings of Daniel. By the way, Daniel gave a specific time when the Messiah was going to come. If you remember from Steve's uh, lesson, this is when he's going to come and present himself. So the Magi saw a miraculous event, and they came and says, okay, where is this king at? We have seen his star. We know he's here. So where is he? And of course, Herod says, okay, uh, we'll consult with our uh, brain people over here. And they said, he's in Bethlehem. Why didn't they ever go there? Do you ever wonder why the Pharisees and the teachers, the scribes, if I told you there's a pile of gold outside, I mean, you would at least look out the back window and see if, there's a, if it's true or not. They didn't go. They just ignored it. And of course, Herod, he didn't want to worship. Of course, Herod was... A, uh, thought he was the king of the Jews and he just wanted to make sure nobody usurped his authority. And of course the prophecy. We could just dwell on this for several weeks. There was prophecy after prophecy after prophecy about the coming of the Lord. Uh, if you remember last week, Chris talked about the, the last, well, some of the last words that Jesus said was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Chris says he was telling those people down there who were uh, making fun of him, go back to Psalm 22, because this is what it's all about. And so he was pointing them back to prophecy. And there was just prophecy after prophecy. And by the way, uh, Steve Hudson, when he did his lesson, he was talking about the prophecy that have not taken place yet, which is the rapture, the tribulation, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, and of course all the trumpets and the bold judgments and so forth. Here's one of them. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And of course, that's found in fulfillments in Matthew, and of course, it's found in Micah as well. So they knew where he was going to be born. Specific. And then, of course, uh, the, the uh, prophecy about the uh, killing of the children. Of course, Herod did that. By the way, Herod was a wicked person. He, you know, they call him Herod the Great. Great in administrative ability, but not great mor morally. He built a monument to his wife, then he turned around and killed her. Then he killed the two brothers. I mean, this guy, when he was about to die, he was dying a miserable death. He says, I know nobody's going to cry over me. But when I die, I want all the leading men in Jerusalem killed so everybody will cry that day. Well, they didn't kill the, all the leading men, but that's the kind of person he was. He was a very wicked person. How about this one? The land of Zebulon, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region of shadow of death, light has dawned. This is a prophecy of where Jesus is going to start his ministry in Galilee, where the Gentiles were, plus the Jews as well. And of course, that's where Matthew lived, by the way, in Capernaum. And then, of course, Zechariah, I'm looking forward to hearing Steve's uh, lesson on Zechariah. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey, which is just an indication that he's coming in peace. And then, of course, how about this? This is the last week's uh, uh, sermon that Chris did. Uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
pointing you back to Psalm 22, which is almost like somebody sat there at the cross just writing down everything happened, except it was several hundred years prior to this event happening that he wrote all this down. How about John the Baptist's testimony? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Holy Spirit testimony. At the baptism, what did the Holy Spirit do? Descend like a dove. Then there's the testimony of the Father himself. Behold my Son, whom and I, I am well pleased with him. Three times the Father spoke in the gospel. In Matthew 3, in Matthew 17, and of course John chapter 12. In Matthew 17, he said, This is my Son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then of course... John chapter 12, God the Father says, I have glorified it, glorified your name, and I will glorify it again. Three times the Father spoke. How about this uh, testimony? Satan. Satan testified that Jesus was the Messiah? Yes, he did. Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 uh, nights, and he was very hungry. And Satan says, well, well since you are the Son of God, so he gave testimony that you are the Son of God. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? And then he said again, since you are the Son of God, why don't you go up to the top of the temple and jump off? And since you are the Son, well, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you every, all these kingdoms. So Satan himself testified that Jesus was the Son of God. How about that? Your enemies are testifying about who you are. How about this? Miraculous sign testimonies. And there are so many uh, uh, miraculous signs that Jesus did. We know he raised three people from the dead, uh, Lazarus being the most notable. We know that he healed Peter's mother-in-law. We know that he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. We know he touched people and healed their leprosy. Sign after sign after sign that he did. And sometimes people stop at the sign because a sign is designed to point to a greater truth. Can you imagine if you went to a doctor? Oh, doctor, my, I got pain here in my chest, and oh, shooting down my left arm and my neck. And the doctor said, oh, here's some pain medicine. Take that and call me later on if it still persists, right? The sign of a chest pain and shooting down the left arm is a sign that, hey, there's probably a heart problem here. Or one of our favorite is, uh, oh, the leg is swollen up so badly. Oh, my goodness. Well, there's probably a deep vein thrombosis there. And what if the doctor says, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it'll go away eventually. Uh, signs are designed to point to a greater truth. Or sometimes you hear the word miraculous signs. But a sign is designed to point to something else that's going on in a person's life. Or in the case, in this case, when you see a miraculous sign, People are supposed to say, what is this all about? What's going on here? And if you remember, most of the people enjoyed the signs. Very few people asked, what is this all about? But we do have a testimony of uh, Nicodemus in chapter 3, who says, you know, we know you're a man from God because nobody can do these signs unless God were with them. So what's going on here is basically what he asked. And of course, we heard the sermon about a man must be born again, and the John 3, 16, and uh, the judgment, what it's all about. In a few sentences, Jesus explained to Nicodemus what this is all about, what these signs meant. So it's very, very important never to stop at the signs, but to always ask what's beyond the signs there. And of course, it was spelled out in Isaiah uh, that Jesus would actually do healing. Actually, if you remember, in the Gospel of Matthew, John, who was in prison in Herod's temple, or in Herod's uh, prison, uh, sent disciples to, to Jesus to say, are you the one that is to come, or should we expect somebody else? And what did Jesus say? He didn't say yes. He says, the deaf are hearing, the lame are, are walking, uh, people that are dead are being raised from the dead. You go tell John that because he was telling him, look back to the prophecies. Am I fulfilling these prophecies? The signs are there pointing that Jesus is the Messiah. Also, we have the good news testimony that testifies about that. If you remember from Isaiah 61, 1, 
uh, Jesus says, I was anointed to preach the good news to the poor. Well, the good news was mentioned in Isaiah 61, 1. How about this? Peter and Martha's testimony. Remember Peter's great testimony? We know that you are the Christ who has come into the world. And a lot less known is Martha's testimony who said, yes, Lord, I know that you're the Christ who was to come. Two great testimonies about who uh, Jesus is. How about this one? The Roman guard testimony. If you remember, the Roman guards went back after the, uh, when the resurrection occurred, they were fearful. They couldn't even move because they saw the angel toss that stone aside and there was an empty tomb. So they went back to the chief priest and said, oh, by the way, an angel came, the tomb is empty, and the Lord is no longer there. So you would think the chief priest would run back there and let's go check out the empty tomb. They didn't do that. But they had a testimony that something miraculous happened there at the tomb. And if you remember also when Jesus uh, gave up his, uh, his spirit, when he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, what did the Roman guard say? Truly this was the Son of God. So there's their testimony. How about Jesus' personal testimony? What he said about himself? You're going to see over and over again in the Gospel uh, or the, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, for I say to you, or but I say to you, he's contradicting popular opinion of what people thought God was. This is what I say to you. You better listen to me. Here's another one. My father. Now, this is a term you would have never used back then. You probably would have been stoned. But when you said my father, that meant you were equal to God. You were God himself in the flesh. That's what you were saying. And that's one reason why they, they crucified Jesus, because they even, you know, the Pharisees even said, you're making God your father. You're making yourself equal to, with him. Well, yes, I am. I am. I am the Lord here in the flesh. Over and over again, these are just a few examples where he uses the term, my father. In, so anytime uh, you see the word, my father, Jesus using that, he's proclaimed himself to be God before the people. Of course, we know this one, I am. And this is uh, what's called the emphatic version in the Gospel of John, but he uses it over and over and over again in the Gospel of John. I am that I am. And so the Jewish people knew absolutely that he was proclaiming himself with, to be God. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the uh, resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Over and over again, he used the emphatic form, and they knew he was saying, I am God. If you got somebody who says, well, you know, Jesus was a good man, but he never claimed to be God, well, guess what? They haven't read the Bible, because over and over and over again, he claimed to be God. Here's another one. I am Lord over the Sabbath. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine somebody coming in here and saying, okay, guys, I am Lord over this day. You do what I tell you to do. Can you imagine that? Take him off to the funny farm. But he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He put the uh, Pharisees in their place. And then how about this one? The confession before the Sanhedrin. If you remember at the last trial, the chief priest says, okay, I I put you on the oath. Tell me whether or not you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus says, it is as you say it is. In other words, yes, I am the Messiah, the one who is to come. And they said, okay, we got our testimony. Let's crucify him. And then, of course, the resurrection itself is testimony that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the Messiah. What the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. How about this testimony? Paul says, declare to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Here's another testimony, the church testimony. It is a supernatural creation of, you know, of the Holy Spirit. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, the church appears upon the scene in 33 AD, and then by 300 years later, 
it had taken over Rome. Just to, and then, of course, worship went from the uh, Sabbath to the first day of the week, from the seventh day to the first day of the week there. And so the church's testimony, a supernatural creation. And so that is what we call credentials, folks. And Matthew wanted to make sure people knew the credentials of Christ so that his Jewish people, his friends, would believe him. And then, of course, Matthew himself is a testimony uh, to the goodness of God and, and to the Lord being the Messiah. So we talked about Father, Father, and Father over again. And we're going to come back and revisit that. But one thing I wanted you to be aware of, of what I do now is when I pray for people, and I'm talking about Christian people, people I know to be Christian. For instance, my wife. Uh, back in March, she was really sick. We were both sick, by the way. You know, that type of sickness where your head's so stopped up, you can't breathe, you're breathing you, like that. You know, what I'm, you're talking, you know what I mean, especially in Louisiana. Well, when I pray for her sometimes now, I don't just say, Lord, my wife's sick. I bring God the Father to the equation, so I say, Lord, your daughter is sick. She needs your help. That's your daughter there. Can you do something for her? So I bring God into the equation now. When I pray for another person, I might say, actually, I was praying this morning. I said, uh, Lord, Nick Greco, your son, is preaching this morning at another church. He needs wisdom and the ability to share from the Word of God for you. So I bring God the Father into the equation. And so it's a good way to pray now when you have somebody you know who's a brother and sister in Christ. You could say, well, hey, that's your daughter. Can you do something for her? That's your son. Can you do something for him? And pray that way. It brings God, make it more personal. And remember the verse I told you, though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. Great verse. That's in Psalm 139, I believe, is where you find that one. And of course, there's another one. Thus say the high and lofty one, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, but with him who is humble in spirit. So bring God into the equation when it's time to pray, when it's praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, I'm done so far, guys. Is there any questions here? If you want to read ahead, read the, uh, the uh, blesseds in, the gospel, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, because we're going to talk about the priestly blessing. And where did that come from? And I hope to show you some things that I didn't know before that I learned in my study of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Any questions or comments or any uh, observations or something that you know that might help us? No? All quiet here today, guys. All right, let me pray for you. And Lord, uh, I want to lift up each person here. You have your sons and your daughters here, sisters and brothers in Christ. And I just pray, first of all, your protection upon their spirit, their protection upon their physical being, but also, Lord, use them in a way that they can honor you and bless others. And I pray this in your son's name. Amen.